Um, I always love to give a talk at Stanford. It's, it's kind of a second home uh, for me. Uh, and uh, this, the pain group at Stanford is just, uh, in my mind, it's, it's a model for what all places should be doing. So today, what I'm hoping I'll do is change your mind a little bit about how your brain processes a pain signal. I also hope to convince you that understanding how these uh, changes in the central nervous system in the setting of chronic pain are critical uh, to understanding your patients and hopefully will help you to take care of them uh, a little better. Okay, I have some uh, disclosures that I wanna make. Uh, first, that I'm uh, a, a, an expert witness uh, defending Johnson & Johnson in opioid litigation. Uh, the other conflict is that I'm a neurologist. So I tend to believe that uh, what's going on in the brain is probably the most important thing in medicine. Um, I also would like to uh, dedicate this uh, talk today to Don Kennedy, who uh, died uh, a couple of years ago in, in the early COVID epidemic. He was my PhD uh, mentor, and he was uh, head of the Food and Drug Administration. He also was president of Stanford University uh, at a critical time for the university and uh, just, a, just a dear, dear person that I miss and love. Uh, I, I graduated from uh, Stanford Medical School uh, in June of 1965. Uh, and uh, the, the days that I spent there were among the happiest of my life. So, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about pain, some of the, uh, the circuitry that's involved and how that might change and how that might differ in patients with chronic pain. So this is the uh, canonical uh, pain model that uh, we all pretty much accept. And I think it's uh, very much validated. Uh, the idea is that you activate nociceptive terminals in the peripheral tissues, musculoskeletal, right? Uh, the skin, the brain, uh, you name it blood vessels, they're all innervated by nociceptive fibers. Uh, when there's impending tissue damage or any kind of intense stimulus, uh, these fibers, they tend to be of small diameter, slowly conducting, are activated. They transmit that message uh, to the superficial layers of the dorsal horn. Their neurotransmitter is glutamate. They activate second and third order cells. These cells then send their axons to the opposite ventral part of the spinal cord. Uh, the spinothalamic tract is the major one that we know about, but there are spinoreticular, spinoparabrachial projections as well that were later discovered. Uh, once these terminals get to the thalamus, the signal is distributed to a variety of cortical areas. And this was only understood after we developed functional magnetic resonance imaging, which allowed us to correlate activity in specific parts of the brain with an awake patient telling you the level of pain intensity uh, that they were experiencing. And what's shown on this side, these areas that are sort of light green and, and red are areas that show a correlation, a highly significant correlation with patients reported pain intensity. So this is the anterior cingulate, somatosensory cortex, uh, the insula, and the second somatosensory cortex. So presumably, when those areas are activated, then you have this mysterious subjective perceptual event, which we call pain, right? So I'm a neurologist, and for me, pain is the activity in the circuit that leads to people telling you that they have pain. But chronic pain is is quite different. And I'm sure that uh, many of you in the audience, and I know Beth for sure, understands that uh, these patients, uh, the chronic pain is different in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the most important ways is that the reported pain intensity is not consistently correlated or it's not correlated in a lawful way with, with the level of tissue damage. And that's very different from acute pain where you can actually adjust the intensity of the stimulus 
to point where you get to uh, potential tissue damage and then people will tell you, yeah, that's pain, that's more painful, that's more painful, and they can rate it zero to 10. There's nothing there, it's very difficult to correlate any kind of pathology that you can see with imaging or on, on physical exam with the level of pain intensity that people report. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, you'll understand that a little bit better. Frequently, there's psychological comorbidity. Uh, this is something we often don't like to discuss with patients, but it's pretty clear that under certain circumstances, anxiety and depression can be correlated with a worsening of pain intensity. We'd like to know how that comes about. But what I mostly want to talk about today is how learning and expectation, and this is this will be normal learning, uh, but with a persistent input of noxious stimuli or some persistent peripheral tissue uh, process that leads to learning and expectation that changes the wiring in the brain and changes the way people uh, experience it. So I'd like to talk about a study that uh, I did in collaboration with colleagues at Northwestern University, Marwan Baliki and Vanya Epkarian. And in this study, uh, we compared normal subjects with age match uh, patients with chronic back pain. It was a relatively small study, which is uh, about eight people in each group. And what we're looking at here is just an applied stimulus. We're not looking at the chronic pain process that's going on. That's been going on for years in the pain patients. But what we're doing here is comparing how a pain signal is processed in people with chronic pain compared to those uh, who are normal. So what you see up here is each one of these little boxes is the application of a pain stimulus of varying intensity and varying duration. And above here is the pain report. You can see that as the pain's applied, the report of pain uh, tracks it pretty well in time. Below is a uh, uh, processed uh, artificial color showing areas of the brain that are activated by this painful, this acute painful stimulus. And what's shown in this, this track here, the top level of, of images is the parts of the brain that are similar in terms of being activated by these stimuli in the normals and the chronic back pain. Down below is a subtraction. So what is what areas show a difference between chronic pain and normals in the response of the nervous system to an acute noxious stimulus? And there turns out that there, what we found was the main place where this happened, where there was a very significant, uh, statistically significant difference was in an area down here. Let me blow that up. Um, and that this is a, an area called the ventral striatum or the nucleus accumbens, right? So this is, a, this is a part of the brain that's gonna come up again and again. It's not traditionally thought of as being part of the pain processing system, but it's consistently activated. And this is the one area that really does seem to be markedly different in people with chronic low back pain compared to normals. And this is in how they handle a, a typical acute noxious stimulus. This was thermal uh, pain. Okay, so you hopefully you're scratching your head and saying, well, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, does this change make any sense biologically, right? Uh, why would you want to change how you process a nociceptive signal over time? You know, uh, that there has to be an explanation for that. And then, you know, some of you might actually realize that this nucleus cumbens ventral striatum area is part of the so-called reward circuit. I think people are starting to change their mind now about that region of the brain and thinking, well, maybe it isn't just pain, maybe it's involved in all types of value assessment. Okay. 
So uh, when I got to Stanford uh, Medical School, uh, Don Kennedy had just been hired and he was hired as an assistant professor in the biology department. And he gave a course on animal behavior. I was in my second year at, at Stanford Medical School and I took his course. And uh, this, so I, I, in my research career, I have to say that I started off in a biology department. So evolution is a big part of what you learn in biology. And so the, here's a few principles that I think are important to keep in mind. One is, you know, we often think about, well, you know, here's our brain, here's our self, there's our mind. Somebody comes and, you know, whacks us on the arm, you know, with a hammer and hurts. Uh, the signal is transmitted, comes to the brain. It's a kind, it feels like it's a passive event, right? But if you think about it for a moment from an evolutionary perspective, any kind of sensory information is useless uh, unless you can act on it, right? So during this lecture, what I'm gonna try to convince you of is the only way you can fully understand pain is in the context of how that information is used to guide behavior. Right, it is so understanding the pain sensory system is not enough. You have to understand how that how the brain uses that information to benefit the individual. Right, so to me, this is sort of the key principle that I'm trying to get across, and it's quite simple. There are two distinct biological functions of pain, and neither one of them have to do with the subjective experience that you know, brings people to see a physician. One is it produces a motivation, right? It, the motivation is I got to stop this thing. I either have to escape, get away. I have to do something to minimize tissue damage. So that's the biological, that's sort of the immediate biological effect of the activity in your pain sensory system. Okay, motivation. Right, so motivation, what is motivation? It's what drives action, right? So again, gets back to that point that I was making before, sensation is meaningless unless you can act on it. And pain is intrinsically motivational. It's that you can't have pain without this motivation to escape. But the other point, and the, the one that I'm gonna mostly focus on today is, that pain is a teaching signal, right? You remember things that are painful and you avoid those situations. You're more careful in the future. You know, if you slam the car door and you got your thumb caught, next time you hold your arm closer to your body when you're closing the door, right? This is function number two. It's a teaching signal to inform future decisions, again, to minimize tissue damage. One, immediate, to future situations. Okay, so here's, an, here's a nice test that we uh, used in the laboratory to assess pain. Uh, it's a three compartment box. Uh, you let the rat roam around in it and then you close it off. There's a little guillotine door that slides shut. You can find uh, the animal we were working with rats to one of the compartments. And as you can see below, there's a little uh, camera, you can uh, apply a noxious stimulus uh, through the floor uh, with a thermal uh, stimulator. And if you do that, hold the animal in there, say for a, a few minutes, deliver a noxious stimulus, and then let the animal run around, the animal will avoid the room in which it's experienced a, a noxious stimulus. So for example, one Typical model that's used in pain research is injecting a dilute concentration of formalin. It produces an immediate pain that lasts for about an hour and a half, and then the animals are okay. But then you test them and they learn to avoid where they've gotten that noxious stimulus, right? Okay, so what's going on here? The teaching signal alters predictions that govern actions. That's what we've just seen in this, this uh, this behavioral test that I just uh, illustrated. So you're in a situation, 
It's a given context. You've been there before. There are a bunch of cues going on. And based on that, in your brain, you make a prediction. Oh, my God, you know, the last time I was in there, something bad happened. It hurt. And I really got to get out of there. So that's the action. And then there'll be an outcome, right? Now, if the outcome is better than you expected, let's say that you got out of there, you avoided the pain, or you had ongoing pain, you engaged in action, and that reduced the pain, right? Or you, you made a prediction, maybe it was a bad prediction, you had an out action, you went to the other room, and let's say that there was some food in the other room. You learn, that's a reward, that's a, what's called, called positive reinforcement, and then that information is fed back. The next time you're in that situation, your predictions have changed, right? So now the prediction is, well, if I engage in that action, something good's going to happen, right? Okay, so that's, that's what's called the teaching signal. You make predictions. You engage in an action. You have an outcome. It's better than expected. You positively reinforce that action, right? It's so called instrumental learning. Okay, now the, uh, the opposite could happen. You could be in a context, you can make a prediction, you can engage in an, out, in an action and the outcome is worse. Let's say you went to the other room and your pain got worse, right? Then you're gonna revise your predictions and the next time you'll be less likely to engage in that same out, action. So we're constantly going through life, changing context, changing, you know, different cues are coming on and we're making predictions about what's going to happen if I engage in this action and then something will happen and either you'll be correct, in which case you haven't learned anything and you just, you'll continue to make the same predictions in the future. That's often what happens. But when there's a surprise, when the environment changes, when the outcomes change, that's when you learn and that's when you revise your predictions. Okay, so I wanna put a little table up here because this is a very important point that I'll come back to uh, in this talk. So we just talked about, a, let's say reward. You make a prediction, let's say, of a certain level of an outcome that's gonna be positive, uh, in, but the outcome actually is less. Let's say the reward is smaller than you expected then over time, or there's no reward, in which case the behavior will be extinguished. If the reward is better, then you reinforce the behavior. You're more likely to do it in the future. If the outcome is exactly the same as the prediction, then there's no change, there's no learning. You see exactly the same thing for pain, for punishment, right? You make a prediction, the pain's gonna be X, and then it's, even worse, right? So then you're, that's gonna lead to extinction. So note that the prediction of pain being worse, right? And the, the prediction and with an outcome that's worse than prediction, you extinguish. With reward, it's the opposite. If the outcome is less than predict, you extinguish. Conversely, let's say you predict a certain level of pain and instead the pain is less then you're gonna get reinforcement. That's gonna be good. That's the same as getting a reward that's greater than expected. So pain that's less than expected is identical to a reward that's more than expected, right? So let me just emphasize that. So these are equivalent for learning. And we call you know, a relief of pain a negative reinforcer which is the opposite of a punishment. So they're formally the same. So if you remember one thing from this slide is relief of pain is a reward that's equivalent to having an outcome, a reward that's greater than expected. And it turns out, and this is work from Frank Pareka's lab, that it's very similar circuitry that mediates the reward from pain relief as from getting a a positive reward, like let's say chocolate or money. Pain relief is a reward. Okay, so just in summary, predictions inform decisions. 
Uh, that's why we make predictions, right? Because we wanna get it right. Outcomes can change predictions, right? Expectations, and that's the subject of today's talk, expectations are the subjective correlate of predictions, right? And it turns out that expectations are powerful modulators of behavior. They not only you know, help guide our behavior, they actually exert bi-directional control through top-down modulatory systems. Okay, so is this relevant to chronic pain? And here's, this is a great study out of Canada, uh, three different uh, Canadian pain centers. There were over 2000 patients and they did uh, complete intake interviews of the patients and they went through a variety of factors that to try to see which factors were important in predicting the outcome of treatment in a multidisciplinary pain center. And what they found was the biggest predictor of whether your pain center, your approach, whatever that approach was in these three different pain centers, the biggest predictor of patient outcomes was patient expectations at, at entry uh, to the program. So they looked at here, variable one is expected relief. Um, here, you go down to four, changes in pain intensity after six months is highly correlated with uh, the expected pain relief here. Uh, that's uh, zero, zero, one. So expectations are incredibly important in treatment outcomes. And that's, that's the, those are clinical studies in, in chronic pain. So I wanna talk about a little study uh, uh, that John Keltner did, uh, this is a while ago, uh, where we were just looking at people learning about the effect of sensory, neutral sensory cues on pain intensity. So the, the test went as possible, as as follows. So they either receive 48 degree centigrade stimulus or a 47 degree centigrade uh, stimulus. So this would have been given a pain rating of let's say about eight. This would have given a pain rating of around six, right? And, and we proceeded the high intensity stimulus with a cue, it's a red background with the words high pain or with the low stimulus intensity, the cue was a green background on a, t on a screen, a computer screen with low, the words low pain, right? So over time, patients came to associate the cue with stimulus intensity. And then uh, on, on random occasions, we would switch and give the high pain cue with the low intensity stimulus or the low pain cue with the high intensity stimulus. And what we found was, not surprisingly, if there was a high pain cue and a high intensity stimulus, the average pain rating was around 8.2. Uh, if it was a low stimulus intensity and a low uh, cue, the low pain cue, the pain rating was uh, a little under six. Now, if you had the high pain cue with the low pain stimulus, you got a significant increase in pain intensity. If you had the low intensity Q with the high intensity stimulus, the pain rating was significantly lower, right? So what this shows is that there's bi-directional control, that contextual cues, neutral cues can influence pain ratings acutely. And this is an acute situation. So this has nothing to do with chronic pain, but the importance of the finding is that there are neutral cues all around. They're always present right? You go through your life, you have these cues uh, and they become familiar. But if you have an, uh, let's say you have an ongoing nociceptive stimulus coming in, now these cues come to be associated with that pain input, right? And so it's changing the expect expectations. So now when you go back to the same context or the same cues are applied, that same noxious stimulus gives rise to and a subjective intensity that's greater. Okay, okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about placebo. This is something that everybody's familiar with. And this is a, one of my favorite studies from uh, Amanzio and, and Benedetti. It, it's a long time ago. These were normal volunteers. They, they had a blood pressure cuff put on their arm, pumped up a, above a systolic, right? And then they were exercising. And the idea was how long could they exercise under a scheme of conditions before they had to stop due to the pain, right? So uh, the control on day one, they didn't do anything. Uh, and the average duration that people could tolerate was 15 minutes of this exercise. However, on day two, they started an infusion. Uh, they gave, it was saline, so it wasn't anything. And they said, this is a powerful painkiller. And on average, there was a significant, but relatively small increase in people's ability uh, to tolerate this ischemic uh, muscle uh, situation. And then they go back on day three just to see that it's reversible. Uh, there was no infusion and they're back to where they were before. Now, here's the, here's the beautiful part of this experiment. So it's very similar uh, uh, setup, except that on day two and day three, they actually got an infusion of morphine. Right, and then after having those infusions of morphine, they're given a saline infusion on day four. So day four is equivalent to day two prior to the morphine conditioning. And you can see that the conditioning greatly enhances the placebo effect, right? So you can train the brain and improve people's you know, confidence in their expectation of relief, and then they get a bigger placebo effect, right? So the placebo effect is not a standard level of relief, or it's not, it's something that can change in people based on experience. So here's a very powerful expectation effect. I love this study. Okay. So, you know, what's, what is this all about? What's the biological value of being able to modulate pain intensity. Why would you want to do that? You know, uh, obviously, this is a critical signal. You need it for tissue protection. You know, why would you want to suppress it? Are there, or is there any biological value in suppressing pain? And the answer is, of course, yes. And, it, and that can only be understood in the context of conflicts with competing motivations that are also certain essential for survival. So again, we're getting back to the biology and the evolutionary meaning you know, of, of modulation, of pain modulation, of the variability of the experience of pain and why under certain circumstances, it actually might be to your advantage to be able to ignore and suppress the pain signal or at least suppress the responses to the pain signal, right? So let's say you're hungry, you haven't eaten in days, Right, and uh, you know, you know, you can have to uh, do something that really hurts, uh, you know, to get dinner. Uh, maybe it's to, you know, endure a few bites from whatever prey that you're trying to capture. Anyway, you get the point. Um, so this really, I think, the, the systematic study of this began uh, early in the last, the previous century. Uh, Pavlov uh, did this famous experiment with dogs. I'll just uh, read the slide. He said, when a noxious stimulus is rapidly and repeatedly followed by feeding, all signs of pain are lost and replaced by approach and salivation. In other words, because the noxious stimulus is a sensation, it can be a cue to a rewarding situation, right? So yeah, it's painful, but it's predicting a pleasurable outcome, a reward, in this case, it's food, which is very important. And it appears as though the animals are not experiencing any pain. In fact, they might ex be experiencing paradoxically pleasure from this noxious stimulus, which is a cue to reward. Um, and a little bit later study, uh, a little bit more systematic than Pavlov, this came out of Albert Hertz's lab uh, in Germany. And uh, this, this goes, I love this experiment because it, it, it's so cheap, right? They just had a hot plate, right? They put the rat on the hot plate. They didn't turn the hot plate on, 
They just put the rat on a hot plate for a few times over a period of, of weeks. And then uh, they would feed them either their regular lab chow, uh, in which case there wasn't much of an effect. Uh, then after they did, they had the animal on the hot plate, it never turned it on, was fed on the hot plate, the regular diet. Then they turned on the hot plate and measured the latency for the rat to get off, right? And it was around five seconds. Now, in another group of rats, they fed them chocolate covered graham crackers or cookies, same situation. But then when they turned the hot plate on after the training, the rats were able to stay on significantly longer, right? So their expectation of a reward was able to turn on their pain suppression system so they could wait a little bit longer to get that highly desired reward, right? So here we're getting at this place where pain and reward are opposite hedonic values, but they're always interacting based on predictions, right? You make a prediction of pain, you're gonna have pain, rewards become less valuable. You make a, a, a prediction of a reward, pain becomes less painful, okay? Very simple. There seem to be, uh, this has been, this type of work's been replicated. I think that's uh, what's going on with placebo. I think it's an expectation of a reward, i.e. the relief of pain. How does this happen? Well, in addition to this bottom-up pain sensory system, there's also a top-down pain modulatory system. This is something that I worked on for years uh, with uh, Alan Bassbaum, Mary Heinricher, and other people in the lab. This was our big interest. How did this uh, top-down system work? Uh, runs from cortex, some of the same areas of the cortex that are activated by the noxious stimulus. Uh, uh, there's some new uh, parts to this system that aren't shown on the slide, including the parabrachial nucleus. Um, this area, the periaqueductal gray, is in the midbrain. Uh, it receives cortical inputs. It projects to an area in the medulla and the in the medullary area has neurons that project directly to the spinal cord. They do, they not it's not just to the spinal cord, but they project specifically to those parts of the spinal cord that receive input from the small diameter nociceptive fibers and contain second and third order neurons which transmit the pain message. So you have this whole brain system that's been activated by noxious stimuli or uh, external neutral cues feeding down through the midbrain medulla and controlling the pain message as it enters the spinal cord. So this information about no susception doesn't get through. It doesn't enter any part of the nervous system. You, it even suppresses withdrawal reflexes uh, when the system is uh, fully activated. Does this happen in people? And it was very gratifying to me to see these publications about a decade ago out of uh, uh, Christian Buchel's lab in Hamburg, uh, where they were looking at people they gave uh, that had a pain state where they were given a placebo. Some of them responded and they correlated the relief that people got from the placebo uh, to blood flow changes in different areas and these areas that they found correlated to um, areas in the brain uh, of, of rodents uh, that are part of this uh, pain modulatory system that we talked about in the previous slide. Even incredibly, uh, they were able to fun functionally image the spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord, down is dorsal here. This little blip is activity in the dorsal horn produced by a noxious stimulus in the periphery, you know, pretty incredible. And then that activity went away with giving a placebo. So if you got placebo relief, not only did you activate these, these centers in the brain that are part of the modulatory system, you could also demonstrate that they're having an inhibitory effect at the level of the spinal cord. So this is a pretty good confirmation of the idea that placebo or the expectation of relief engages this top-down system. 
you know, I would, you know, it's, it, it's always incredibly gratifying when you can see that work that you've done looking at, you know, neurons in the central nervous system of uh, animals in preclinical studies is validated in studies of humans who are able to tell you, yeah, my pain is less, and you can correlate the changes in activity uh, of different areas, in this case, the modulatory system and the spinal cord with the reduction in the pain report. So this is in pretty incredibly gratifying work uh, from uh, Dochel. I'll talk a little bit about the mu opioid receptor, uh, definitely my favorite molecule in the brain. Uh, this was uh, cloned in 1982. This is a review uh, from uh, Birgitte Kiefer, who's in France. Um, she, made, she was the first to make a mouse with the gene deleted for the mu opioid receptor. And once a, a, a mouse that doesn't have the mu opioid receptor functioning gene, you can give them a ton of morphine, no analgesia, no reward, no respiratory depression, no nothing. So you can completely explain the effect of morphine and drugs like that uh, on the basis of their action at this mu opioid receptor. So it's pretty critical. And it's a very potent effect, as you know, if you've ever uh, had or, or prescribed an opioid. Uh, and uh, Brian Kvilka, actually at Stanford uh, a decade ago, he uh, got the crystal structure of the mu opioid receptor. So we, and that can be used to help design new and better opioids. So it isn't enough to have a receptor, you have to have some kind of chemical that acts at that receptor, right? And uh, it turns out that in 1975, Hughes and Kosterlitz uh, reported that they had extracted a couple of uh, small peptides, and this is methionine and leucine and keflin, uh, from the brain of a pig that had the properties of morphine, right? I mean, you've got these peptides, you could put them on these experimental tissues and uh, they had the same effect of morphine and you could block them with an opioid selective antagonist naloxone, right? So that was a big event. And then once you've got those peptides, you can make antibodies and you can trace their location in the central nervous system of animals and, and people for that matter. And it turns out that, guess what? Uh, every site along this top-down pain modulatory pathway, including in the superficial dorsal horn, uh, have endogenous opioids. They also all express the mu opioid receptor, so you can inject morphine into any of these sites and get pain relief. And anyone that's done intrathecal opioids, you know that they can act directly on the spinal cord uh, to relieve pain. So, th so this is cool. So You've got endogenous opioids. You've got the mu receptor. They're in the central nervous system. We know that you've got top-down modulatory uh, circuit. And here it is, the, the endogenous opioids are present in this top-down system. Uh, do they do anything meaningful in patients? And let's go back to this beautiful study that I love from Benedetti's lab, where they basically did the same you know, procedure here. Uh, and then instead of giving saline on day four, they gave naloxone on day four and they got no placebo effect, right? And so this kind of validated some work that John Levine and I did uh, back in the seventies where we had bl would block the placebo effect uh, with naloxone. So it looks like the expectation of let's say the reward of pain relief led to the release of an endogenous opioid acting at the same receptors that morphine acts at. So this is kind of cool because, right, you've trained the person, these are people uh, with morphine. And then when you give them what looks like morphine, they release something in their own brain that acts at the same receptor that morphine's acting at, right? So uh, you're kind of mimicking uh, what happens pharmacologically through expectation, 
right? Again, confirming the power of expectation to modulate pain. I keep coming back to that because I think if there's one message from this talk, it's that. Okay, so remember uh, the earlier study that I talked about with John Keltner, where we, we had these neutral cues, uh, and what that showed was that this expectation effect is bidirectional. So you don't just have top-down inhibition, you have top-down facilitation of pain, right? And it turns out that if you look at the individual neurons in this pain modulatory pathway, there are two types of neurons that have opposite firing patterns. And through a variety of experiments, we were able to show that uh, one of these cells, which seems to shut down just before the animal withdraws uh, from pain, we call that the off cell because they have to shut off to allow the rat to escape from pain, right? So we call that the off cell. Um, and you can demonstrate that that actually has an inhibitory effect on pain. You have to shut it off in order to respond. Right Then the other type of cell in the same area, which we call the on cell, shows a short burst just before the animal withdraws, right? So, and we had a, a, a set of experiments to show that that cell, if you selectively activate that cell, you can get pain facilitation. So uh, pain, these are cells that are present in the PHE and in the medulla, including those cells that project directly to the dorsal horn bi-directional control, right? So here's a cartoon illustrating that. You have the nociceptive input coming to the transmission cell and it can either be inhibited or excited. So the message that gets to the brain is an additive function of your input and your top-down, in some cases, learned expectations activate either a facilitating neuron, the on cell, or an inhibiting neuron, right? So if you have a given input, let's say of one, and you have a descending input of one, then your output is two. If you have an input of one and you have an, an inhibition of one, then the activation of this T cell is zero. Very simple. Uh, and really beautiful, robust effects of morphine. If you give morphine to the uh, systemically in this case, or you can give it locally. So the morphine is right next to the neurons that you're recording from that's shown here. Let's you give morphine and then you get an increase in activity of the off cell. So morphine increases the activity of the pain inhibitory cell. And then it uh, inhibits these pain facilitating neurons. So it has a double effect, right? It's promoting inhibition and it's turning off facilitation. That's another reason that opioids are so powerful. Okay, so you have bidirectional control. Opioids have, uh, you know, uh, opposite effects on the uh, inhibitory and excitatory cell. All right, so let's talk about what this is all about. Why do you have this bidirectional control? What is it doing? Um, the conflicting goals demand a decision, right? Okay, so uh, you have to make a decision. You're gonna do a cost-benefit computation that precedes your action. You have a noxious stimulus. You have these conflicting drives. You have a cost-benefit computation. You make a decision. And then if it's to ignore the pain, you have an opioid release, you increase your off cells and uh, you have a decrease in pain intensity. Conversely, if the decision is, I gotta get out of here, I have to respond, then you get your on cells facilitating you have an increase in pain intensity. So let's get to where in the brain this decision is being made. And I talked about the nucleus accumbens. It receives a major dopaminergic projection uh, from the midbrain. This was discovered animals will press a lever uh, to receive electrical stimulation. So it was originally thought of as a, a reward pathway. And in fact, it's activated by drugs of abuse and that's all very confirmatory. If you micro-inject an opioid into the nucleus accumbens, it promotes feeding and it suppresses pain. So it does what it should do if this nucleus accumbens is involved in decisions. It turns out in the human, there's a high density of mu receptor 
in the nucleus accumbens. So this is the same area that is different in the chronic pain patients from the patients uh, from normal volunteers, right? A lot of mu receptor in the nucleus accumbens and uh, using a similar uh, C11, this is a uh, half, it's a carbon molecule with a half-life of 20 minutes. Uh, so you can give it twice, you give it once, you see the binding, you give a, let's say a placebo, the binding goes down, that means an endogenous opioid's been released. This is showing that with placebo analgesia, there's release of an endogenous opioid in this decision circuitry. But the decision circuitry is also activated by pain predictive cues as well as reward predictive cues. So I'm not going to go into detail about that study. Let's just say that the nucleus accumbens shows an increase in activity with pain predictive cues and with reward predictive cues. Let me switch over. And it turns out that the nucleus accumbens itself has two types of neurons in it. Uh, D these are dopamine, different dopamine receptors, D1. Uh, these neurons tend to be rewarding when they're activated. Uh, the D2s tend to be aversive and pain facilitating when they're activated. Okay, so the pain activates the D2s uh, and you get hyperalgesia. This is work uh, from the REN lab uh, in, in 2016. Uh, morphine activates the D1 cells. Uh, this is Annexon's work again a few years back, it's rewarding. You get anal, and if you activate these cells, you get an analgesic effect. And that's a, a very recent paper out of Sato's work in Japan. So you got the nucleus accumbens bi-directional output. So here's the model, prefrontal cortex, uh, you get a pain predictive cue, uh, or you get a reward predictive cue. The pain predictive cue facilitates pain, the reward predictive cue inhibits pain. Now we're not quite clear on how the nucleus accumbens talks to the pain modulatory circuit, but it seems like it must. Okay, so in summary, uh, pain occurs in the context of conflicting motivations. That's the key sentence. Because you have conflicting motivations, you have to do a cost benefit analysis. In order to do that analysis, you have to make predictions. Predictions are essential for optimizing decisions, you know, based on reward approach or pain avoidance. The subjective correlate of that is expectation. As I said, the descending control is bi-directional. I can go over that. So the key point clinically is that you can learn to feel or you can learn to ignore pain. Pain predictive cues increase pain. Pain itself is pain predictive. Expectation of future pain, you know, uh, goes down with early effective intervention. It gets the expectation of pain increases with each ineffective intervention. So you can either have a vicious cycle where you have pain predictive cues, the pain doesn't, you know, continues, and you just reinforce the expectation that you're going to have pain that makes the pain more intense, and then the expectation goes up. Right, or you can have, uh, you know, relief and a virtuous cycle, and then pain gradually fades. For some patients, an improvement has to involve changing expectations. So this is sort of the slide that you should remember. Pain can worsen over time with no change in no susceptive input. The expectation of future pain increases. That is the vicious cycle. This is a learned CNS dysfunction. What can you do? Uh, clinically. Assess patient ex expectations, really, really important. People can hope that you're going to help them, but expect that you won't. And it's important to counter this unrealistic pessimism with facts. Set realistic goals, create a therapeutic alliance. And finally, uh, I'd like to say that optimism is useful and ethical, uh, and scientific progress, at least in my mind, supports an optimistic attitude for many of our patients with chronic pain. Patient-centered research is the key. So keep it up, good luck. And with that, I'd like to thank Beth, uh, Ashley, and Sprill for inviting me and all of my colleagues. And I'd be glad to take questions. Oh, thank you so much, Howard, for a terrific talk.
Um, you know, you and I have published on the topic of opioid tapering and in particular forced opioid tapering. And, you know, without having to give a completely separate lecture, are there some key takeaways that can inform why the practice of forced opioid tapering is particularly detrimental for patients? Well, thanks for asking. I wanted to talk about that, but I knew I wasn't going to have time. And I think that uh, the most important data related to that is the research that's been done on pain controllability and pain intensity. So there's some beautiful studies, uh, again, with normal volunteers, whether, you know, the same pain intensity, whether they can control it or whether it's completely investigator control. And there's a highly significant correlation with people's subjective experience of uncontrollability and how intense the pain is. So, you know, unless you're doing the taper with the full consent and participation of the patient as agent, uh, you're, you're almost doomed to fail. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. We had a lot of great questions. Um, is pain a sensation or a perception? And what are your thoughts on cognitive penetrability and pain? Well, certainly pain is, is, is a sensation. It's also a perception. It's also a motivation, right? And it has multiple sides to it. One of them is actually the quality and intensity this seems to be computed in somatosensory cortex, but there's also the unpleasantness and aversiveness, and I call this the motivational side. That seems to be a separate parallel circuitry. So you can, you know, impair people's ability to locate and uh, assess the pain, and it still retains its aversiveness. Conversely, you can block the aversiveness and still, say, oh yeah, that's pain in my finger. You know, it's I give it a 10, but it doesn't bother me. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but. Is it possible to experience pain without nociception? That's a great question. And I think it's related to, uh, though there's two ways to approach that. So the first one is, can you experience pain if there's no activation of nociceptors? And I would say absolutely yes. And the reason we know that is that there are places in the brain that neurosurgeons have accessed, and this would be in the ventral posterior lateral thalamus, so you can put an electrode down there and stimulate. There's no nociceptive input, right? But the patient says, oh yeah, you know, I feel a burning, you know, in my, in my foot, right? So, so in terms of, you don't need a nociceptive input to feel pain, right? So, um, and then I guess the other side of it would be, no susception as a po or, or sensation as opposed to the aversiveness, they're separate. So you could presumably activate the aversive circuit, which includes anterior cingulate in particular, right? And, and uh, get somebody to say, oh yeah, that really feels terrible. I don't know whether I'd call it pain or not. Thank you. How does anxiety fit into the expectation model? Okay, so this is a really good question. Again, these are all great questions. Um, so there's been a lot of research on that actually. And, and anxiety, if you're anxious about the pain, then the pain is actually felt as more intense. If you're anxious about something other than the pain, then it actually can have an analgesic effect, right? So it, it's, it's where the anxiety is focused that seems to be important. Fascinating. Uh, this is uh, from Sean Mackey, terrific talk, Howard. Why do you think that motivation did not make its way into either the original IASP definition of pain or the revised definition when it is so fundamental? Yeah, so, um, well, I have a philosophical answer to that. And that is that, um, by and large, over the last 30 to 40 years, pain research has been driven by psychophysics, right? As opposed to biology. In biology, we're always trying to figure out, well, you know, what's it for? What's it doing? Uh, it, it, it's interesting that Pat Wall himself said pain has to be thought of in the context of 
an action decision, right? Uh, but the people that were doing the taxonomy that were making up the definition were not biologists, right? There's nothing wrong with their definition. It's just incomplete. Thank you. Um, this is from what great questions. We should just go on and on. I don't <laughs> I, want to stop. <laughs> I know. I know. When we're past the top of the hour, let's do one more. Okay. Uh, this is from Dennis Given. It would seem that presenting outcome data to patients supporting the effectiveness of a multidisciplinary treatment program would increase the likelihood of those patients benefiting from the treatment. Yeah, you would think so. But the only way you're going to find out is by actually doing it. You know, studying because, it, yeah. Well, you have to study it because, you know, uh, if people are skeptical about, you know, pain clinics in general, uh, that's, that's, they, they may get the information, but they may not believe it. That's why I say it's, you know, people can, would come into my office when I was seeing patients and they'd say, look, you know, you're my last hope. I've, I've seen everybody. I've done everything. I've had every treatment, you know, and I've run out of options. And I'd say, well, do you think I can help you? And they'd say, not really. <laughs> So, I, so you're already answer. you're already starting off in the hole, and that's why right. I think that right. it's really important. It's an educational process yeah. to try to, you know, get away from the the unsupported pessimism, yeah. right, it's, of it's catastrophizing. True. Well, you know the, the know that you know it's true because that you know it's it's kind of core to your approach. You know, I, I think it really nicely illustrates um, the the detriment that is caused by waiting until all medical treatments have failed to integrate in pain psychology and to then refer to a psychologist. It's uh, such a disservice to patients. It's such a disservice to the profession that could potentially help a person. But what is being encoded is failure. And then, oh, the physician's giving up on me now. They're sending me out to the psychologist. My pain isn't real. It's all psychological. And nothing could be further from the truth. So it's actually, you know, the deficiencies of how we are integrating or not integrating our treatments, the order in which we approach them, the messages that we give, we've we've really failed patients in so many ways i could not agree with you more that's exactly right you know it, it's 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 at, it's backwards it's backwards it's backwards and you know and your research nicely shows that and uh, a lot of us here even on this webinar are on a mission to change that um, Howard, thank you so much uh, for your uh, generosity and your time in sharing your life's work and your wisdom with us.